President, I ask unanimous consent to enter into a colloquy with the Senator from Maine, my colleague, Sus Senator Collins. Without objection. Thank you. We're here today, Senator Collins and I, because we agree that we must take action in this body and in this Congress to avoid sequestration. Sequestration is a term we've all been throwing around, and it refers to the automatic cuts that is scheduled to take effect on March the 1st. Those cuts were designed to force Congress to make a tough decision and to take comprehensive action on our debt and deficits. Now, I think we agree that there's no question we need a comprehensive and balanced plan to put us on a more sustainable fiscal path. I think that plan should look at all areas of spending. It should look at domestic, mandatory, and defense, as well as comprehensive tax reform. And I think there are many areas of bipartisan agreement on deficit reduction, including controlling the long-term cost of health care. Unfortunately, Congress has missed several opportunities to enact a long-term plan to get our debt and deficits under control. That's why we are again facing a deadline at the end of this month to address those automatic cuts. And as a result, we're starting to see the very real and negative consequences of our inaction. We're seeing it on our national security. We're seeing it on our economy as businesses and agencies alike begin to prepare for the automatic cuts under sequestration. Earlier this week, Senator Collins and I, actually it was last week, Senator Collins and I wrote to the leadership in the Senate, urging bipartisan action on sequestration and the need to find a better approach. In our letter, we talked about the impacts that we're starting to see in New Hampshire and Maine, including the threat to jobs and to our national security and to the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, which is critical not only to New Hampshire and Maine, but also to this country's national security. We called attention to the drastic effects that we face for our economy, for our jobs, and for our national security. And today, we're here to reiterate the importance of addressing sequestration and doing it now. I want to thank the senior senator from Maine, my colleague, for joining me here today to talk about this important issue. And I'm looking forward to hearing her remarks. I know it's something that she cares about as much as I do, and as much as I think most of the members of this chamber care about. Mr. President. The Senator from Maine. Thank you, Mr. President. First, let me say that I'm very pleased to join with my friend and colleague from New Hampshire to speak out against the indiscriminate meat ax cuts known in Washington as sequestration that are scheduled to take effect in just two weeks' time. We simply must take action to avoid this self-inflicted harm to our economy and to our national security. But what I find inexplicable is a growing acceptance that sequestration is going to go into effect despite the fact that virtually everyone should concede that across the board cuts where we don't set priorities do not make sense. There are good programs that deserve to be preserved. There are programs that have outlived their usefulness and should be eliminated. And then there are programs that could be cut and reduced. But that's not the approach we're taking. We're not going through the budget in a careful way, identifying programs that could be eliminated or reduced, setting priorities and making investments. No, we're allowing to go into effect across the board cuts that fall disproportionately on the Department of Defense. And indeed, we're already seeing the effects of 
of these cuts on our military because each of the military services has begun planning for the likelihood of deep budget cuts. The Navy is preparing for a civilian hiring freeze and cutting workers at shipyards and base operating support facilities. Now, Mr. President, I want to be clear exactly who these employees are. These are the nuclear engineers, the welders, the metal trades workers, repairing submarines and ships at the Navy's four public shipyards, including the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in my home state of Maine, which employs half of its workforce from my colleague state of New Hampshire. I know that the senior senator from New Hampshire shares the concern about this particular installation on the border we share. But of course, the damage of sequestration extends far beyond just one installation or two states. Just this morning, I was over at the Pentagon and I took, avail took advantage of the opportunity to sit down with the Navy's top shipbuilding official to discuss what, sh what the impact of sequestration would be for our naval fleet. Well, one example we've already seen, the Navy will keep the USS Abraham Lincoln, a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, in port rather than re repairing and deploying it. Across the fleet, the Navy is being forced to reduce deployments, maintenance, and overhauls for critical repairs. Uh, when we look at the shipbuilding budget, it is evident that sequestration and the continuation of a partial year funding resolution, known as the continuing resolution, would be absolutely devastating for our Navy, for shipbuilding, and for our skilled industrial base. And that includes Bath Ironworks in Maine, which I'm so proud of, which builds the best destroyers in the world. And this has consequences, not only for our workforce, but also for our national security. It's important to note that Secretary Panetta has made clear that allowing these sweeping cuts to go into effect would be, quote, devastating in his words, and would badly damage the readiness of the United States military. The fact is defense has already taken a huge reduction in future spending. The defense budget has been cut and slated to be cut by $460 billion over 10 years, and that is before sequestration. When this number is added to the defense cuts scheduled to begin on March 1st, we are looking at an enormous impact on the, our national security. Now, it's important to recognize that we're not saying that the national debt is not a problem. Certainly, when you have a $16.4 trillion debt, that is not sustainable. And the national debt is a security concern in its own right. In just last year, in 2012, the federal government spent $223 billion in interest payments alone. That means we're spending more on interest on the national debt each month than we spend in an entire year on naval shipbuilding and the Coast Guard budget. Just think about that. The interest payment in one month exceeds the entire Coast Guard budget and the entire budget for shipbuilding in the Navy. And the estimates are by the middle of this decade, not some distant year, our interest payments to China, our largest foreign creditor, at $1.2 trillion, will be covering the entire cost of that communist country's military. Think of the horrific irony of that. 
at the same time that America is bound by treaties to defend our allies in Asia against Chinese aggression, the American taxpayers are bankrolling the threat through the interest payments that we are uh, paying to the Chinese. Now, Mr. President, neither the senator from New Hampshire or I are saying that the Pentagon should be exempt from budget scrutiny or even future cuts, but the disproportionate impact that sequestration would have on our troops, on our national security, is dangerous and it must be averted. And the department cannot continue to operate on a continuing resolution that increases costs, prevents long-term planning, and makes it impossible for the department to function effectively. I would yield to my colleague from New Hampshire to expand on some of these points, and then we will talk further about the impact. Thank you, Senator Collins, and, and thank you for really laying out um, what we're seeing in terms of the potential impact of those automatic cuts. I mean, the, the comment and the statistic you had about China and what they're gonna be able to do with the money that we're paying them is really eye-opening and scary. You know, you talked about some of the impacts that we're beginning to see at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. And as you pointed out, it's something very important both to Maine and New Hampshire. It employs about 4,000 workers, um, almost evenly split between our two states. And as the result of the sequester, starting March 1st, one of their major projects, the repair of the USS Miami, which was damaged in a fire, is going to be halted immediately, just stop 16 days from now. The Navy's going to cut over 1,100 temporary civilian workers, mostly from shipyards like Portsmouth. And the needed maintenance and military construction will be postponed indefinitely. And it's not just about those jobs at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard or at the shipyards uh, across the country, but that has a ripple effect across our economy and it affects the, the grocery stores and the restaurants and all of the small contractors and small businesses who are doing work at those shipyards. There will be ramifications for our national defense across the services. You know, yesterday we had some really harrowing testimony in front of the Armed Services Committee from all of the chiefs of the military outlining what they see coming as the result of the consequences of the sequester and of the continuing resolution that you talked about. DOD-wide, so across the department, they expect to lay off a significant portion of the 46,000 temporary and term employees. All services and agencies will likely have to furlough most DOD civilian employees for up to 22 working days. I mean, imagine that. That's a whole month of uh, paychecks that those workers are not going to have to support their families, to be able to spend into the economy, and that's going to have a huge impact. It's possible that DOD might not have enough funds to pay for TRICARE, um, for health care coverage for our veterans through the end of the fiscal year. And as we saw on the front pages of the paper this week, the department delayed the deployment of the USS Harry Truman, the carrier strike group that was headed to the Persian Gulf. Um, if sequestration goes into full effect, the Navy will shrink by about 50 ships and at least two carrier groups. And by the end of the year, the Navy, if we do nothing, will lose about 350 workers a week or 1,400 a month from our civilian industrial base. That'll have a huge impact in New Hampshire. I know it will in Maine as well. Um, so there are real significant impacts, as you pointed out, on the defense industry, on this country's national security, and on the domestic side of the budget. It's already starting to have ramifications on our ec economy and job growth. We saw in the last quarter of 2012 that our economy contracted for the first time since 2009, and much of that decline 
was due to sharp reductions in government spending in anticipation of the sequester coming into effect. We saw it in New Hampshire um, in our some of our businesses that are dependent on government contracts, particularly in the defense industry. So our failure to act is not only irresponsible, but it's beginning to have a real impact in slowing down this economy. It's simply unacceptable that we are not addressing this. We need to act. If we let the sequester go into effect, we stand to lose, according to the Congressional Budget Office, up to 1.4 million jobs. And a recent forecast from macroeconomic advisors suggests that sequestration would reduce our gross domestic product by 0.7 percentage points this year. We can't risk putting our economic recovery in jeopardy with these indiscriminate cuts. They're going to have an impact on research and education, vital to our ability to grow this economy and remain competitive. The National Institutes of Health would face a $2.5 billion cut they would have to halt or curtail scientific research, including needed research into cancer and childhood diseases. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention would see a $464 million cut. State and local communities would lose billions in federal education funding for Title I, for special education grants, and for other programs. And as many as 100,000 children will lose their places in Head Start. 25,000 teachers could lose their jobs. And uh, we, see, we will see those impacts immediately in Maine and New Hampshire. And I, I want to turn it back to you, Senator Collins, to share what you're seeing in Maine. Thank you, Mr. President. First, I want to commend the Senator from New Hampshire for broadening the debate and reminding all of us of the macroeconomic impact, as well as the impact on our two states. In Maine, the estimate is that Maine's defense industry, that includes not just the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard and Bath Ironworks and our Pratt and Whitney plant, but a lot of smaller contractors and suppliers, that as many as 4,000 jobs could be lost as a result of sequestration, think about that. That means that, as you pointed out, these are people who are supporting their families, who are supporting other businesses in the community. The impact, the ripple effect is just devastating. That's why it does not surprise me that the Congressional Budget Office has pointed to sequestration as a primary cause for the slow growth that we've seen already, and that CBO projects that our economy would grow at a faster rate, at 2%, if we averted sequestration. And these are meaningless numbers. They affect real people. The estimates are that we would lose between 1.4 and two million jobs if this is allowed to go into effect nationwide. And it's also a failure on the part of Washington to make decisions. If we're going to allow these mindless, indiscriminate cuts to go into effect, why are we here? We might as well have computers or robots making decisions for us. Our job is to do the hard, painful work of setting priorities and making decisions. And that's why I am so frustrated by the approach that we appear on the verge of taking. And the senator from New Hampshire made some very important points. Well, the Department of Defense would take a disproportionate impact from sequestration, and I'm extremely concerned about that. There are other important programs that would be affected as well. 
The superintendents groups in Maine have met with me and talked about what it would mean for school children in Maine if halfway through the school year, more than halfway through the school year, all of a sudden they get a reduction in Title I money that goes to low-income schools, in special education grants, in other important programs, uh, such as Head Start, the TRIO programs, which helps low-income and first-generation students attend and excel in college. Think about the low-income home energy assistance program, biomedical research that is so critical, cuts in the FAA workforce that could reduce air traffic control, disrupting air traffic during the busy summer months, the list goes on and on. Essential education, healthcare, research, transportation programs that deserve support, that don't deserve to all be treated the same. And again, I want to emphasize that we recognize that spending must be cut and that the debt at $16.4 trillion is way, way out of control. That amounts to something like $52,000 for each man, woman, and child in this country. We are committed to seeking pragmatic solutions through compromise and to avoiding this devastation of our economy and our national security. We recognize that we have to look at all areas of spending and that we need to overhaul our tax code and make it more pro-growth, simpler, and fairer. If ever there were a moment when members of Congress and the President should put aside their politics for the greater good of the nation, now is the time. So I, for one, want to thank the senator from New Hampshire for caring so much about this issue. And we have agreed to work together and continue to work together to address this. These automatic cuts were never supposed to take effect. I remember being told, don't worry, it's never going to happen. It's too unpalatable. It'll, it'll just never occur. Well, they were supposed to force us to make the difficult decisions necessary to put our economy on a sound footing and to deal with our unsustainable debt. Our nation's leaders, the president, Democrats and Republicans alike, have denounced sequestration for the most part, and yet here we are. So I hope that we can work together to avoid this fiscal cliff, which will have such damaging effects for the people of this nation. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, thank you very much for your kind words, Senator Collins. I, I know that we both care a great deal about the situation that we're in, as I think most of the members of this body do. And what's so frustrating is that it's, unavoid that it's avoidable. This is not something that has to happen because we're facing um, a, a crisis. This is happening because of what we have done um, and our actions. And so we can undo these actions, as you point out. And I share your belief that we need a comprehensive solution. We've got to look at all aspects of the budget, that we need to look at domestic, defense spending, mandatory programs. and. We need to look at revenues, comprehensive tax reform. That's a way that we can address that. And there are areas of bipartisan agreement that we ought to be able to take action on right away. You know, we've had a number of GAO reports that make recommendations on duplicative programs within government. We've, we're already working to control the long-term costs of health care, to close tax loopholes, and on defense spending, we all know that there are still reforms that can be done, as you pointed out. We can get better fiscal controls. We can end some of the fraud and abuse in contracting. You know, that's just the beginning of a list that I'm sure if, if we all dedicated ourselves to coming up with a compromise on how we avoid the sequester, we could do that. And 
We should not delay because our failure to resolve this issue is having damaging effects on our economy, and it's only going to get worse if we don't find a solution. So again, I thank you, Senator Collins, for your commitment to address this challenge that we face, for your willingness to come down and um, engage with me, and to work for us to work together along with our colleagues to try and get a resolution so we don't have these devastating cuts go into effect. Thank you very much, Mr. President. We yield the floor. Mr. President.